Um, we are privileged this afternoon to sit with uh, Professor Anton Stoltz. Uh, he's an uh, infection control specialist uh, in, involved in different, uh, different of the arenas of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and it's wonderful to be with uh, Prof this afternoon um, just to check in and to give us some good information in, the, in these times that we're living. Uh, Prof, thank you very much, and uh, please uh, make use of the time to give us the information that you think we need. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you guys. I think it's important that the message goes out, uh, because what I'm seeing outside is that people are perhaps not afraid enough, uh, or perhaps afraid enough is not the right term. People are not concerned enough, you know, and what they're saying already, it's now holidays, let's go on holiday. This is not the right way of doing this. If we talk about social distancing, and I'm going to talk about it just a little bit later, it, it, it's a real thing. So let's start and say, why did this thing happen? So if we look at about 15,000 before Christ, what we know is that people moved around. They didn't have houses, and what they did is that they actually uh, hunted for food. And what happened was they were never at one place. And then later on, uh, the type of life changed. And it took actually all of history up to 1830 to actually put one billion people on the planet. As soon as we become that amount of people, you actually started needed farms. And people started living next to animals. Okay, And that is where the problems perhaps started. And the reason why I'm saying that is that we know that about 6 out of all, well, 6 out of 10 uh, infectious diseases is actually uh, originating from uh, animals. Three out of four outbreaks at the moment is due to animals that's involved. So, where did this corona start? Well, what is important about it, most of the coronaviruses is uh, living in bats. Now, what we know about the SARS-1 outbreak, uh, what we know is that the outbreak was in 2003, and then what you need is the bat cannot give it to the human, okay? And what is needed is there is an animal in between that is needed. So what happened was that the bat gave it to the civet cat, the civet cat actually gave it to humans. So that is the way that SARS-1 was actually uh, started. If you look at MERS, which was a little bit later, 2013, 2014, what we know, there was also the bat and what was involved was the camel. And the camel actually was the animal that was in between giving it to the humans. So let's go back to where this thing started. So we think it's from bats. And what we know is that we do not know at the moment what is the animal that's giving this to us. Okay, we, they went back and had a look and see, can they find the first patient that was actually infected with uh, um, this novel coronavirus? And it's interesting to actually read an article where they say in 17, on the 17th of November, they could actually trace back that they think that was patient 1 that was actually infected with the novel coronavirus or SARS-2. So what is interesting about it is that around about uh, the 24th of December, they already knew that it was a coronavirus. They, at, in the beginning, they thought it was, at the, uh, it was the SARS that was coming back, the SARS-1. But then, around about the 2nd of January, they knew that this was a novel organism. It looked like uh, SARS, but it was not. And at that stage, the virus didn't have a name. And soon what they saw, even round about the 24th of December, they saw round about six people already uh, in the Hubei province that actually came in to hospitals there and they all had the same disease. So it took all of this time to actually up to the, about the 31st of December before uh, China decided that they will call this a new uh, outbreak and then all the things came into place. From there things moved very fast. I mean, the whole genome was worked out and then suddenly the whole WHO became involved and that was important because the sooner you can get it, the sooner you can start making plans. Alright, so this is a little bit about how it started over there. What we have seen is that this is a very fast moving organism. It is not the same as influenza, but it behaves a little bit like influenza which is a seasonal disease, and this is not seasonal, uh, it is a new outbreak. So what we know is that the viral load that is happening with this disease is very fast and very high. So what we know also about the transmission of this organism is that as I speak to you, or I cough, or I sneeze, what will happen is small particles will fall from my mouth. 
And this small particle is anything from about 1 micron to about 100 microns in size. If these particles are coming from my mouth, and that's always there, what happens is they come into the air, they float down and they fall onto surfaces. If they're very big, they fall around me. If they're very small, about 1 micron in size, it is interesting to know that these small particles can actually drift in the air for about 7.9 hours and they take that amount of time to settle 1 meter. So you can ask yourself, is this organism airborne, yes or no? Um, I've been working most of my life in airborne diseases. My, uh, the things that I do research on is basically TB, and there we're actually looking at these small particles coming out of the mouth of people and how do they behave. So what we know is that this organism, like SARS-1, like MERS, is I think partially airborne. Although nobody wants to talk about this because people are afraid of the airborne, it is still particles come, coming out of the mouth, but now they linger a little bit longer. In a Yahama article that was published on the 4th of March, it was very interesting, they took a patient uh, that had the SARS-2 and then they started swabbing around the patient trying to find where could they find this organism after the patient was put in the hospital bed. Well, they found it on the bed, they found it around the bed, they found it uh, basically on the curtains, they found it on the windows, they also found it in the fan that was actually extracting the air going out of this unit. If that tells me, that's exactly what I'm saying, small particles, they drift in the air and they are sucked out. And that is important to realize that this is an important factor when you put somebody into the hospital then you must make sure that the other people are safe from these small particles. Yeah, it's small particles, but they can still drift a long time in the air. So I think that's the important thing for me with the transmission. The other thing that is, is happening is that if I speak to you and I'm very near to you, and near, very near means basically for me six meters. So I know that if I sneeze, I can sneeze a particle up to six meters. That is work that has been done uh, by people like Z. Uh, and what they show that if you sneeze, there's a very high speed uh, of small particles coming out of the nose and the mouth, and that area or that, that, that amount of particles can be sneezed about 6 meters. If you cough, it's around about 2 meters, and I think it's important that if you breathe, about 1 meter. So, in my eyes, I am very worried that if I say to a patient, you can stand one meter from me, I think it's too near to me. So, what is important, I think at least two meters. The interesting thing is that people do not sneeze a lot with, um, with this virus. It is not a disease uh, that makes that type of a symptom. But coughing is very often, uh, but you see that sneezing is not one of the things that is happening to people. So, my advice at this stage, looking at how it will be transmitted, so stay away two meters from somebody that's infected. The other way that is happening is that these small particles that falls on the ground, whether on the ground or on the table or wherever I'm walking, I go to the toilet, I touch the, 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 the surfaces or I cough over the surfaces and I can get it. It's on the taps. It is basically on the door and everywhere where this patient went. What is also known now is that this virus is found in stool. It's also found in serum, it's found uh, in urine. So what is happening is that if patients are coming into the hospital and they have diarrhea because that's one of the symptoms or they are vomiting, we know that in these fluids from the body they can also be, and it is a way in which it can be transmitted. Although it hasn't been shown that there is a fecal oral route of transmission, uh, it is uh, actually, it can be done because we find it in the stool. So one must be very careful and thinking about all these things, how you're going to um, uh, try and not get this disease. As, of course, when I talk about these conditions is that, let's say I am infected and I go home to my family. Where am I going to stay? Well, it's important that I know that I can go home if I'm not ill enough, but I'm going to stay in my own room. And then I'm going to use my own bathroom for the reasons that I just said now. And so there are a lot of rules that must be made before a patient can stay at home. So what we call it self-quarantine, if you are not ill, isolation if you are ill. So if I'm isolated, the rules must be made before the time. So me and my wife have spoken about the rules and what we said is, all right, the rules will be for the patient, it will also be for the other people in the house, and then there are other house rules. Okay, so let's have a little uh, look at these rules. For me, if I'm infected, I must stay in my own room. I must use my own linen, 
I must use my own uh, cutlery and I must eat alone. Uh, it's no good that I go and eat in an area where the kids and the wife is because what will happen is I will infect them. Every time that I sneeze, cough, breathe, what will happen is these particles will fall on the surface that in, in, in which they are at the moment and they're not infected but soon they will be infected. So um, the other thing then is uh, if you are sleeping uh, on white linen, it's very easy to clean them with a little bit of bleach before you're going to put them basically in the washing machine. So there are rules that is happening for the patient. Then for the family, please don't let anyone come and visit. Uh, the kids can talk to me on the cell phone. Uh, what is happening is that I do not move into the areas where the kids are staying and, and on my wife. So if my wife wants to come and check on me, I can show her with a video how I am or I can talk to her and say I'm fine or I don't feel fine. One of the rules is that the patient must be kept happy because what, what will happen is that if he gets uh, 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 depressed or things like this, uh, it will actually be, be, be bad for the whole family. So one must be able to speak to someone but you don't have to be next to someone to speak to them. If you want to go out into uh, the yard, of course that will be easy. Just put your mask on or take a, a piece of tissue paper, put it over your mouth, walk out and go and sit in the wind. This is the best place to be because the dilution of these small particles are so big that it actually doesn't matter, uh, you know, it will fall to the ground, go into the air, but the dilution is so high, it's, it's actually good. So then people can come and visit me, I'm not talking about other people, my family, they will sit at least two meters away and sometimes more. Uh, if I'm sneezing, they will sit about six meters away and we can discuss whatever is needed. The rules of the house is the window stays open. There will be no curtains in front of the window. I need the wind to blow through. And what we have said actually, if we look at that, it's called natural ventilation. What is needed is around about, well, at least uh, 160 liters per patient per second in that room. So you can think that I want the wind to blow through and if there's curtains in the way, they can't. Mm -hmm. So these things are important and it's for the house and it means my windows in the room I'm staying, but also for the rest of the house. Okay, so there must also be numbers up. If I get ill, phone the ambulance. Uh, not everybody is doctors, and so what is needed is that people uh, speak to each other and say, listen, if I am getting fever, uh, you, you feel that I'm getting more ill, please phone the ambulance to come and fetch me. But these things must be discussed before the time. So now we have spoken a little bit about the infection, where did it come from, we've spoken about the transmission, we've spoken about this home isolation part, because there's not a lot of people that understand the whole principle. Um, what about moss and, and respirators? Okay, so I think what is important, I have told you about the particles, if I would put a surgical mask over my mouth, and a surgical mask is a loose fitting mask, what I do is that I prevent the small particles from actually traveling the two meters or the six meters. So that is an important part of infection control. So in my hospital, what I do is that when people come and they phone me before the time, because I do not allow you to walk into my hospital, you will phone, you will sit in your car until I come and fetch you. What will happen is I will take you a mask and then I will accompany you to a specific area where I'm going to examine you. But that area is of course an area where I have chosen that the flows of the air and the things are good. So who should wear masks? I don't think there's any, any use in anyone walking around outside with a mask. I think what is happening there is that what will happen is that uh, you will actually, what will happen is that you will actually infect yourself if you wear it. Uh, there, there is an advantage uh, to actually wearing a surgical mask and that is the advantage is that if it's over my face I, I cannot touch my face. So the advantage is small but it's there. Uh, I don't think that it is of any use walking outside of it but if you are ill I can see the reason to put it on especially if I walk out of the house or I walk into a hospital. Uh, remember that when I get these small particles on my hand and I touch my face, well, we all touch our faces around about 23 times per hour. We, you, you don't even know that you're touching your face. So I think that's the important part of actually controlling disease but the mask is not the thing to do. If we get to healthcare workers, and I'm talking about nurses or anyone that will be working with the patient, as I've told you, these particles, particles, particles can be very small. And what we say is that if the particles is one micron size and I think there's an airborne 
part to it. It is important that the healthcare workers wear N95 respirators. Okay, so this is just a special type of mask that we wear, and what we know is that these uh, respirator masks, what they do is they prevent the healthcare worker from getting infected. Now, in the SARS-1 outbreak, what was important about it to look back is that if I look at the amount of healthcare workers, about one third of everybody, and that was about 8,000 people only that got infected with SARS-1, was healthcare workers. We didn't understand the disease. Now we know a lot about this disease. So what I think is also important about this whole COVID-19 disease is to start to try and understand, because if you understand the disease, your, 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 um, uh, the frightenedness is going away, or the fact that you are not so frightened of what is actually happening. So what will happen to you once you inhale these particles? Okay. So what will happen is the particles will get into your mouth, and most probably they'll get into your lungs. When you inhale them, what will happen is that they will go into the lung, they are looking for specific receptors in the lung, they adhere to these receptors, and they are taken into specific cells in the lung. Then they start to divide in these cells, and what they do is that this inflammation that they cause in the cells is actually causing uh, a lot of other cells to be attracted to the lung. Then what happens is that the lung becomes uh, thick with mucus and with other cells, and the uh, uh, oxygen exchange can't take place in the lung. So, if you have the infection, you will feel, well, first of all, you can have a fever, but what we have known, in Wuhan, only 44% of people started with a fever when they were positive. Later on, 88% in one of the studies actually showed that people got, 88% of people got fever. But what is important about it is that in the beginning, there was no fever. And I'll come back to that because that is important when you look at port health. When port health screens you, it can be that they can miss you because at that stage you will not have a fever. So that is one of the things. The other things that will happen is a cough because of this inflammation that happens. It stimulates your coughing reflexes. Then malaise, which is basically a feeling of unwellness. Uh, you can also feel very tired. Those are the big things that will be felt. Then, of course, there can be a sore throat. There can be other things uh, uh, like they are sneezing sometimes, but that's very uncommon. And then uh, other, other symptoms like flu-like symptoms that you can have. All right, but those are the things that people mostly present with. Of course, there are also diarrhea, and there is also a small percentage of people that can vomit. So these are the symptoms that one must be on the lookout for if you have been exposed to this virus. I can just tell you that up to now, and the date today is basically the 18th of March, we have seen... I think perhaps over 150 to 200 people that came for screening uh, at the hospital. At this stage, uh, we haven't found one positive. Okay, and I think it's important to realize at this stage, we are only starting in the outbreak. And this outbreak, as we go on, the community infections will start now, and we're starting to see it. So from today, there was around about 116 people uh, infected, and we are out of the area. It's only people who traveled. Why is that important? Well, what can happen is that at the moment, the people I have seen and have tested were all ill. So they had these symptoms of COVID-19, and what was uh, interesting, they all tested negative. So how accurate is the test? Because you have to ask yourself, were they really all negative or is the test not good enough? Well, the test is quite accurate and the sensitivity of the test is 75%. Uh, and uh, so there is a small percentage of people that can be missed. So if you are early in your disease, you sometimes what will happen is that you will test negative and only become positive. Therefore, what I tell my patients is if you, are, if you don't have symptoms, please don't come in now. You must quarantine yourself because you don't have symptoms. Once you start to have symptoms, you will isolate yourself, but then you will phone in and come and test yourself. Because then I understand that what will happen is that people who are symptomatic and infected, the test will come, uh, will come out positive. And I think that's an important thing because at the moment, I can even tell you with this small amount of people coming, and I say small amount, it's still overwhelming uh, because what is happening is that people are standing in rows to come and test. Okay, so, and I think it is unneeded if you don't have had any exposure. Perhaps in 10 days' time from now, we will talk 
uh, something else. We will say, well, it's so much in the community, what will happen is that people who have got these symptoms will come in and then we will screen them. Then we will come at a stage where there are so many people that's infected, we will actually stop screening or testing for COVID. Because if you have the symptoms, I can perhaps just take an x-ray or do a scan and I can tell you that you have got this disease. If there are so many people that will come to test, it is impossible for the healthcare system to actually accommodate this amount of people. So, what happens to you if I test you negative now, is that if your exposure was high, and it was a high certainty that you perhaps had it, I will ask you to actually go home, you are infected perhaps, and you must uh, actually be at home and isolated as I told you before. If you are ill, and remember, when we talk about ill people, it will only be about 20% of the population at this stage, if we look at the outbreaks all over the world, is people that will get severe disease. About 4% of this 20%, so 16% will have severe disease, 4% will have critical disease. Now, critical disease means that you cannot breathe, and you need a doctor to help you to breathe. So at that stage, the things change a little bit, and what we know that your life is in danger, all right? And then we will act, and what we will do is that we will help you to actually breathe again. The other 16% we talked about are people that is ill enough to actually come into the hospital. But you can think, if I put a lot of people into the hospital, they will reinfect each other the whole time. So we try to only put the sickest of people into the hospital that really need care. If you are getting better, I will discharge you as fast as possible to make place for other people. So the whole rule of putting people into hospital is only the people who really need care that cannot cope at home. Of course at home, if you get ill, we will bring you in. And then what we will do is that we will help you and to get actually the help you need. So let's talk about the 4%. Now, perhaps we must talk a little bit different. So let's say that 96% of people will be ill and not ill and so the four percent will be the critically ill that for us as doctors is the complicated cases if we look at the death rate and everybody is so worried about the death rate we see it's around about two percent two point three percent depending on which country you are uh, italy is a special case they have more deaths than other countries at the moment uh, we think we understand what's going on there there's a very old population and I will talk about what will make you to actually get more ill and perhaps die. Who are the population that is really that we don't want infected because they have a chance to die. So first of all, the 4%. 4% will come in. We will assess you and according to what we find in your blood and the way you breathe and the way that we look at the saturation of the oxygen in your veins, we will tell you that you need special care. The special care will be in a facility. This facility will help you to intubate you because we think that the 4% you cannot breathe on your own. We will intubate early. Okay? We, it has been decided by uh, the, the group of doctors at Steve Biko Academic Hospital, other doctors also. We will intubate you early because it seems that if I intubate you early, the better you will do. I will not leave you until you can't breathe anymore and then my time of intubation is critical. So, early intubation, early uh, 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 pulling the tube out and you can go home again. How long will you be in hospital? We think around about seven to eight days if you don't have complications. But if you have complications, people are staying three weeks in hospital. The main thing about intubation is that we are just trying to help you. So we will make you asleep and we will put the tube in. You will not even know about it. And what you will, uh, will be uh, uh, aware of is when you uh, uh, awake again, what will happen is that you will find you've got a tube and you are breathing for the tube and you will have a lot of oxygen that will help you to breathe. Now, not all people will survive this disease and it, it is just how it is. If you look at influenza, uh, every year we have influenza and what we know is that the attack rate of influenza is around about 60% and what we know is that there is a huge amount of people every year that gets influenza and die. But People don't think about it because it's seasonal and it's happening every year. People don't think, it, uh, think uh, 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 about this group of people. But the same is going to happen with this um, novel coronavirus. So there are people that will get severely ill and these people we will help. And about the half of the people 
will actually be saved once I intubate you and give you some of the treatments that we do. Now, there's no specific medicines. There is a lot of studies outside there, and we are going to be involved in these studies because it's important that we try and see how can we help people that can't breathe on their own to actually give them the medicine they need. So it's important that these studies take place because then other people learn from it and we can save more people. The more knowledge we can obtain, the 2% the will drop down to 1% or 2.5%. In influenza, the death rate is 0.05% to 0.1%. doesn't sound a lot, but just in America, about more than 60,000 people die every year of influenza. Okay, so it is not uncommon that when you have a respiratory disease or a viral respiratory disease that you can get severe pneumonia. So these people come up and then what they do is when they have this, this 2% or 4%, what they have is severe, what we call ARDS, acute respiratory um, breathing syndromes. Okay, so these things are important because you cannot breathe on your own and you just need the help. So don't be afraid of it. It is just a way that we help people to actually survive the period. Your body will help to cure you. We will give you some oxygen and you can survive this. Who are the people that will get severely ill and will not perhaps make it? So these people are the elderly. And if we talk about the elderly, it actually starts at 60 and older, but what we've seen in Italy, it's basically people that's older than 70 years old and 75, 80 years old that is really struggling. Why? Because all of them has got comorbid diseases. And what is happening is that they do have hypertension. They have got cardiovascular diseases, uh, heart disease. Those things are very important because once the virus gets into your lungs, the inflammation is causing your heart to actually beat differently and it can also make you to get a heart attack because that is the way that inflammation works in the body. Also people that's diabetic. So we know that diabetes in people is actually the group of people that, that can get uh, uh, severely ill and they are in this group that must be stayed away from if you are ill please don't get near to them. We have a huge population of people that has got diabetes and they are special population that we must actually protect. Okay, People that has got cancers have already comorbid diseases, their immune systems are different. Then we come to something that is unique to Africa perhaps or more unique to, to, to South Africa, the HIV population. We are not sure what is going to happen. The prediction is that it might be that if you are not on treatment, your CD4 count is low, what will happen to you is that you will get more severe disease. Why do we say that? There was an article that was published uh, in the Lancet Infectious Diseases uh, around about 20, uh, 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 um, 2012. And what it said was that in the previous H1N1 outbreak of influenza, the H1N1 that started in Mexico and it went right through the world, it was also a pandemic, what happened was that disease actually infected the whole world. But in Africa, the death rates was 15 times higher. It's not only the comorbid diseases that is counting now, but it is the lack of proper medical care. And a lot of people in Africa do not have access to proper care. And I think that's important to realize that we are trying to help everybody, but if you are living in a remote area where there's no ventilators and you get severe disease, you know, there is no chance that, you know, we can help you if you're that far away. Okay, so uh, I think we must be um, uh, realistic. So how many people will survive this outbreak of the SARS-2 or the COVID-19 disease? 98% of people at the moment. Will it be the same in Africa and South Africa? We don't have any data to tell us at the moment differently. We do expect a bigger outbreak perhaps due to all the comorbid diseases, uh, the lack of uh, uh, the care that is in Africa. I think that we, that we know now. So I think what we must do is to prevent this disease. What is the best way of preventing you from getting this disease? I think it's been known now for a, for a while that social distancing is the way to do this. I talked in the beginning about the small particles and I talked about how far I can sneeze it. But what is important is if you're in a group, the attack rate of this organism is around about 30 to 40 percent. Okay, so meaning that 40 percent of people sitting in a room might get the infection. We talk about an R0 value, an R0 value is something that one person will infect how many others and in this case we talk about two, uh, one person will infect two other peoples. It doesn't sound a lot. Let's go back to 1918. 
1918, with the Spanish flu, what happened was that 50 million people died all over the world. And the attack rate of them, the R0 value in this case, was basically 1.4 to 1.8. You don't need a high value. What you need is people to stay away from each other. Now, before I came here, uh, I had a call from someone that was asking, can my child come uh, for a weekend to play with other children uh, at their home because they're having a birthday? No, my child will not go there. And the reason why, social distancing is the thing I want. I don't want 15 other, other kids there and then 50 uh, 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 parents. When we, when we talk about being distant from each other, I think everybody must take it seriously because this is a serious disease and you don't know if you're going to get it, so why looking for trouble and just stay away from each other for a little while? I think it is not too much to ask. Why am I asking this? I will be one of the doctors that will be treating you and I cannot do my part if you, you don't do your part. Your part will be to make sure you, get, you don't get ill. And the way to do it is to stay away from other people. You don't have to go on holiday now. You don't have to fly overseas. You don't have to fly down to Cape Town. I mean, the president has already said, try and stop the moving around. Stay in your houses. Watch TV. Do whatever you want with your family. But please do not go out. Do not go to places where there are lots of people. We are starting now to see the people being infected in the community. It doesn't take a lot of people to move through a mall and then what will happen is that you will touch something or you'll go to the bathroom in the mall and you will be infected. So what I'm trying to tell you is that this is not my disease, it's not your disease, it's all of us. We're all in this and we must work together to make sure that we do not get infected in this disease. Uh, how do you uh, uh, f uh, see uh, from the scientific world how long uh, it will take for this outbreak to uh, really go through the motion and, and, uh, and finish itself? Okay, so there's a few things about it. So when we talked about trying to distance yourself from people, we know that what we don't want is a curve that is doing this. So the outbreak is coming, it's going up. When you have a curve like this, there's a huge amount of people being infected at the same time. So what am I trying to say? I want the curve to move down, but you can see that the time is getting longer. But I'm going to infect about 60% of the country, or not me, but the virus. And what will happen is that it will be over a longer time. I want this, because what is needed with this is the longer the time span is, what will happen is, and it's the same amount of people, it will be better for us. Because we as doctors cannot cope with this amount of people, but perhaps with this amount of people I can cope and save more lives. I think that's the important thing, the message that must go out, is of trying to flatten the curve what everybody is talking about. I think that's important. How long do I think this will, will last? Uh, I've been asked this this afternoon and I must tell you that I'm unsure. Uh, I know what uh, Donald Trump has said in his address to, uh, to the state uh, of, of, of uh, America, but I think what is important is that we are going into our winter months now. We know that in winter months we have more people uh, in a group together and the infections and we, what we're seeing at the moment is reinfections. So I think we can be we must be ready for a longer time of infection in the southern hemisphere. The other thing that we know is that if I get an infection and my immune system is not normal, I will keep on shedding this virus for longer. We see this in the immunocompromised people. So what is important about this again is that that curve then will be longer than other countries and reinfection or infections to new people will be longer. But a time span, mm, I won't be able to tell you. I don't think there's any scientific uh, way to say how long this will last. Um, we hope that it won't be longer than two to three months. I'm convinced it might be a little bit longer than that. Perhaps I must just say, yeah. uh, if you look at being infected, you will get infected on day zero. Then what will happen, the mean of disease is will come out on day five. That was the incubation period that we are seeing. Okay, If you got very ill, day eight, you will get severely ill. So what we're seeing is that uh, people who get severely ill will be on day eight. 
but then you will progress from day 5 to day 8 and we will be able to see that you are progressing with this disease that you've got. Of course, what is also important is that the progression is not only to do with the virus, it can be other infections on top of this, and I think that is also important that one realize that there are other factors uh, and other comorbid diseases that can make you to have more severe disease. Why is incubation time, uh, then what we say, or uh, uh, isolation time, not to 14 days? Most people will get their disease on day 5, and usually by day 13, what we've seen, nobody else will actually get ill. The chances that you will get ill after that time is so small that it's, it's insignificant at the moment. Um, we thank uh, Professor Anton Stolz for his time and his uh, expertise. Um, and we also would like to uh, wish uh, you and the team uh, uh, a blessing and uh, strength and insight and wisdom. Uh, we pray for a break uh, somewhere that we have uh, that can give us an edge. Uh, but thank you for what you are doing and we as a community uh, would like to uh, uh, be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Yes, yes, thank you. I think that's the most important thing that everybody stand up as one person and act in the correct manner. I think that's very important.